Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming PMH Atwater. Walter Russell, the unusual pattern of his near-death experiences and how they prepared him for cosmic consciousness. Walter Russell was born in 1871 and refolded in 1963. We have no record of what his mother's pregnancy was like, his birth, or the years immediately after. Considering the times, it is possible to suppose that early on there could have been health issues. He was drawn to music and became a musician in infancy. Remember that. We don't have any records of his birth, his mother's pregnancy, but we do know that as an infant, he became a musician. Think about that. Remember that. At the age of seven, he nearly died, cause unknown. Visions from that event enabled him at the age of 10 to leave school, seek work to help out his family's financial disaster. He got a job as a cash boy in a dry goods store, then secured a, a church organist position that later enabled him to pay for five years of art school. Think about that. At 10 years, this kid is on his own, making enough money to help out his family and to support himself. 10 years old. At 14 years, he died again, this time of black diphtheria. He was officially pronounced dead by the attending physician. He claimed to have learned the secrets of healing when he entered at one moment with God during this experience. Now, of course, the near-death experience when he was a kid was unknown. His idea of entering at one moment with God was being completely submerged and filled with God at the age of 14. Every seven years afterward, he had a dramatic visionary experience. Get, get that. Every seven years afterward, he had a dramatic visionary experience very similar to a near-death experience we would call it in, re in research a near-death-like experience that enabled him to find out and explore the secret mysteries of his inner self. This continued until 1921. During this time, he excelled at everything he did, won lasting friendships, lucrative art commissions at a studio in Carnegie Hall in New York City, became a commissioned sculptor for pre President and Mrs. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was a longtime friend of Mark Twain, painted and sculptured Thomas Edison. His motto, mediocrity is self-inflicted, genius is self-bestowed. Self I'm going to say that again. Mediocrity is self-inflicted. Genius is self-bestowed. 49 years, he's 49 years old now. This is what happened in 1921. At the age of 49, he was suddenly enveloped within the fullness of cosmic consciousness. This state lasted for 39 days and nights without abating. Now, think about that. Most of us have an enlightening experience or a visionary experience or even a near-death experience. And it'll last maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, hour, maybe a day. 
39 days and nights without abating. His testimony, my personal reaction to the great happening left me holy mind, but with, with slight awareness of my electric body. During practically all of the time, I felt my body was not part of me, but attached to my consciousness by electric threads of light. You've seen depictions of this all over this museum. When I had to use my body in such as writing in words, the essence of God's message, it was extremely difficult to bring my body back under control. What he means by this, he couldn't hardly hold a pencil. Couldn't hold a comb or couldn't hold anything. He couldn't hold things, relate to things. He couldn't be a part of the earth world. It, it was, it's very similar to the near-death experiencers who have very long and intensive experiences. When you're back, you're not back. You're still there. You're still having lots of challenges in just being a human being again, putting on a dress or a coat, picking up a cup. You know, it's like, what's the cup? Why am I doing this? I mean, what do I have to put on clothes for? <laughs> Going to the bathroom? You're kidding. <laughs> just that kind of thing. Compare Russell's unusual pattern of illuminating life events with the research of Richard Maurice Buck, a medical professional who began a rigorous research project on the subject of enlightenment in the late 1800s. Now, Dr. Buck's work still today is the seminal research anybody uses and still uses to be able to understand cosmic consciousness, full enlightenment, how it works, um, the people that have it, um, all, all of those kind of details, those research details, still today, people use that, scientists use it, people, everybody uses it, really. Um, and, it, and it's called cosmic consciousness. He finally narrowed his study to 50 cases he believed to be genuine. These people had another type or another kind of consciousness. They appeared to operate on a higher, more spiritual level of mind. He called this shift of mind cosmic consciousness, which of course is the name of his book. Of the 50 original cases in his study, Buck ascertained that 14 of them had attained spiritual enlightenment. The remaining 36 were in various stages of partial development. His revolutionary work has become the standard, as I said, for identifying individuals who achieve this high state of mind. He has 11 points. Now, I'm going through this. I'm going to be going through three studies. First, concentrating or looking at Russell, now looking at what Buck found, then later what I found with its children who have near-death experiences. I'm doing this to illuminate and to show that we just don't have sudden enlightenments, although they are sudden. The beginnings of those begin in childhood. As we've already seen with Walter Russell, 
dramatic changes in childhood that changed his consciousness. Now we're taking a look at Dr. Buck's work. He found a pattern of 11 points. Now he was dealing mostly with adults. Number one, the subjective light. A brilliant, blinding flash of light, sometimes like a flame, that can expand in size and brightness, unearthly hues and brilliance. So I know a lot of you here in this room have, have had something like this, have gone through something like this. Number two, the moral elevation. Once illumination ceased, individual becomes extremely and unusually moral, upright, shunning temptations to judge or criticize, feel a duty to serve God and humankind. The intellectual illumination. During the experience, all is revealed, secrets of the universe made known. The individual feels no weight, is overwhelmed by love and glows, feels reborn in a union of soul with God. Number four, the sense of immortality. Thinking is replaced by knowing. I know a lot of you are going to relate to this. Thinking is replaced by knowing, aware of divine identity. You know who you are after one of these. And nobody can, can tell you different. You know who you are. Aware of divine identity that we are all co-creators with the creator. All of us. Five, the loss of the fear of death. Indiv individual now knows death does not end life. It's only a change of awareness. The loss of the sense of sin. The individual understands that evil is simply good, misused. Hey, well, I'm going to run through that one again. The individual understands that evil is simply good misused. All things are good in God's eyes. Misusing good is present in everyone. We are capable of changing anything and turning it around. I'm going to read that again. <laughs> Hope it sinks in. We are capable of changing anything and turning it around. Yes. Seven, the sudden, the suddenness, instantaneousness of the awakening. The actual moment of illumination is always unexpected and sudden, as if in a flash. Some remain in this state for days. Induced, uh, you're going to love this. What Buck is warning us, induced illumination is not as powerful as the natural version. He warned about gurus from India or elsewhere misleading people. You know, the guru type, gurus are wonderful, but they can also be not so wonderful. So be careful of the clown in guru's clothing. Number eight, the previous character of the person, intellectual, moral, and physical. Most were morally upright, highly intelligent, strong bodies, strong minds to begin with. Although several in his study were sickly and died young. Some were born with genius, yet expanded that ability even further. Number nine, the age of illumination. You know, kind of pay attention to this. In all of his cases, the, indivi the individual was more mature when illumination occurred, usually between 33 and 42 years of age. The majority experienced their, br their breakthrough in springtime or early summer a few in January or February. 
I, I know you know of childhood cases of illumination, grand, illumina grand illumination. There's not that many. And even, th even in those cases, they had a lot to go through afterward. Number 10, the added charm of the personality so that men and women are attracted to the person. Illumined individuals become so magnetic. Other people and animals, especially animals, birds, are drawn to them. They seem to have divine protection. Animals are at ease in his or her presence. The transfiguration of the subject of the change is seen by others when the cosmic sense is actually present. There's a marked change in appearance afterward. Yes, there is. In everyone I've ever seen, child, teen, adult, if they had a real Um, if they had a real change, a real transfiguration of, of, of some kind, they will change how they look afterward. They will also change how they behave afterward. They seem to glow and have a light around them. The change can be as if they became another person. No, they're not walk-ins. For those of you who study walk-ins, no, this is not a walk-in. The faces are different. The more of themselves, great somehow. Even, in, uh, even with near-death kids, not only do they look different, they act different. Um, the family... The, 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 the siblings accuse the near-death kids of coming from another planet because they don't fit the family anymore. Dr. Buck went on to state that each person underwent a time of solitude and seclusion after their illumination, filled with doubt and confusion. I want to underscore that. I don't care how great it was. I don't care how glorious it was. I don't care how filled with the secrets of the universe you were. When you come back, there's this feeling of, ah, what happened to me? And you doubt it. You're confused. You really don't know what to do about it. Because there's always after effects. Always after effects. Individuals were obviously disoriented and physically pained by what happened to them. Get that. He described perfectly the major after effects experienced by near-death survivors. He noted that each person left the organized church of their time. Several initiated new religions while others went on to live a just and moral lifestyle. I want to underscore this with big, huge black letters again and again and, and lines again and again and again. Every single person was, in ju was judged insane by their peers at the time. I don't care if it's a child. I don't care if it's a teenager. I don't care if it's a, an adult or an older person. Every single person was judged insane by their peers at the time. Some are still today classified as insane on historical documents of that era, even though each more than proved the worth and value of their enlightenment. Every one of them experienced paranormal phenomena and psychic abilities. Every one of them became childlike, innocent, and trusting, even to the, the point of appearing somewhat stupid. Dr. Buck became convinced that the day was coming 
when anyone could gain spiritual enlightenment if they so desired, he felt this mass awakening would herald the beginnings of a new race, a new evolution of humans. How many times have you heard that before? You even heard Walter Russell talking about it. His conclusion, so will cosmic consciousness become more and more universal and appear earlier in the individual life until the race at large will possess this faculty. The same race, and not the same, for a cosmic consciousness race will not be the race which exists today any more than the present race of men is the same race which existed prior to the evolution of self-consciousness. The simple truth is that there has lived on the earth, appearing at intervals for thousands of years among ordinary men, the first faint beginnings of another race. This new race is in the act of being born from us, and in the near future, it will occupy and possess the earth. I wrote about this in my book, Children of the Fifth World, which are coming in in mass right now. I spoke a lot about Dr. Buck's work in my first book, Coming Back to Life, The After Effects of Near-Death Experiences, because it's so similar to what I found as a researcher. It is almost unnerving how similar the after effects of illumination are to the after effects of a near-death experience, especially those that are more intense and lengthy. In my book, The Big Book of Near-Death Experiences, I explore the range of ages, types of experiences, and connections to the enlightenment process globally, including charts, photographs, drawings, sidebars, <laughs> and even cartoons. <laughs> you betcha. When researching near-death experience with the children, however, that's when I discovered the incredible links to the life story of Walter Russell that dovetail the work of Dr. Maurice Buck. All three. At the same time, matching my own research with child experiencers, especially the youngest of the young. And here we have the book of early whisperings by Walter Russell in his earlier times, earlier years. My first study, done in the 80s and 90s, 277 cases interviewing kinder, kindergartners up to young, young adults for NDEs between birth and 15 years. Most who participated, however, were under the age of seven. I had two event clusters, birth to 15 months and three to five years. Did you know kids that young can have a near-death experience? Did you know a kid at birth can have a near-death experience? Let me give you one of my cases real quick. This, this child was having uh, a near-death experience in the womb as she was being born while her mother was attempting suicide. You can get these cases all kinds of ways. Forward looking. These people were looking forward. That is to say they were very young and they were looking ahead in years. In my second study, however, I went after the older ones. This is done three years ago, between 2016 and 2019, 
120 cases of NDEs occurring between birth and the age of five. So I'm going after the little ones now, the very little ones. With people now in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s who could verify and validate that they had a near-death experience between birth and the age of five. What I wanted to know was, did having a near-death experience at such a young age have any, did it have any difference in your life? If it did, what? In essence, I was asking for essays, but, um, you know, a, a lot of phone calls, a lot of, of emails, questions on my part. But I was after details, family, siblings, friends, schools, sex. I mean, growing up, sex, sports, dating, work, further school, careers, marriage children, grandchildren, drugs, alcohol, counseling. I wanted to know what it was like. Did it make any kind of a difference? These were backward looking. This is the first study in the world, never been done before, where we've got forward looking and backward looking. So we have a chance to see did it make any difference in the individual's life. Let me tell you the people that um, took part in this study. This one fellow uh, in his late 60s, he had just retired. And he was so overcome that finally he could say something. Never been able to do it before. Finally he could say something. He he sent me back a 50-page essay. <laughs> uh, you know, it was just, it, it, it was, it overwhelmed him that finally he could talk to somebody about his near-death experience. I got ever so many essays back from people who was, the, the text was so tear-stained I could hardly read it. Same thing. Finally, they could talk about their whole life. Not just a single event. What's it like for your whole life? Boy, did I get some surprises. I think you're going to get some surprises, too. Because actual age, when near-death experience occurred, was almost the same with both studies. I used both together. Research findings identical as well. I consider the following to be universal. And I've got several notes here. If you're interested in this study, we do have books downstairs with the Russell's books for sale, The Forever Angels. You're gonna be very shocked and surprised at what's in that book. Child near-death experiences, birth to five years, basic after effects pattern. Here's a little note. A young child will think differently than anyone else in the family, nine chances out of 10. That child will see through the parents, the siblings, the teachers, the school kids, and know what everybody else is thinking and feeling. So your little kid's going to see right through you. Another note, the majority showed th signs of synesthesia, an elaboration in the limbic system of the brain that resulted in blended or multiple senses. Let me give you an example. I was born with synesthesia. School teachers, beware. A lot of these kids are coming into school with synesthesia. The limbic system in the brain, that's your emotional center. That's the center in your brain for your senses. I was born with it. No, I was not a near-death kid. I was just born with it. In the first grade, I was the only kid in school who could smell color 
see music and hear numbers. That didn't go over very well with my school teacher. <laughs> I spent most of the first grade on a tall stool in front of my class wearing a conical hat that said dunce on it as a sign of a bad child who told lies. Twice the principal called my mo mother into school. They wanted to kick me out of the first grade. Um, it became such an issue that by the end of the first grade, I knew I was telling the truth. So I decided that every adult was stupid and I was never going to be one. <laughs> well, I grew up to be stupid like everybody else. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it became such an issue for me that, um, that I had to find out the truth for myself. I, I, I was doing double-blind studies with a with control group. Um, actually, by the age of five, I started doing it before then, one year before then. Um, it's a very important to me to be able to prove something. I've got to be able to see evidence. I've got to validate. So this is synesthesia. Be careful with kids who are synesthetics. Here's another note. The majority were abstracting, broad conceptual learning styles by the first grade. They had to go through a learning reversal Go back to concrete, detailed methods of learning in order to stay in school. Let me give you another uh, example. This is from my research bra uh, base. And, th and this is common with, with near-death kids, if, uh, specifically birth to the age of five. In the first grade, they're, they're abstracting. Let me give you an example. There's a little boy in the state of Georgia drowned during first grade, halfway through first grade, when he's able to get back in school. <laughs> what do they read in the first grade? See, spot, run. Dick and Jane. You all with me? He's reading Greek mythology, understands it, goes to his teacher and says, why was the book Robinson Crusoe ever written? Twang! First grade had, the teacher had to take him out of school and put, put him in a special class. Um, I'd say clearly two thirds of the kids I researched were abstracting by the first grade. How many schools in the United States are prepared for first graders who can abstract? Now you know what these kids go through in school. Absolutely. Let me give you some percentages of what I found. Now this is 397 people. This is good research. Mind works different than before, 84%. Significant enhancement of intellect, 68%. Across the range of cases, up to 15 years. When old enough to take the standard IQ test, and remember, most of them were under the age of seven. So they're old enough to take the standard IQ test, going 150 to 160, 48%, that's almost half, are genius. But get this, birth to 15 months, especially if a dark light experience rather than a bright light, to testing 180 and above 100%. There's something about that, bright, that dark light. Kids talk a lot about the three lights. There's this raw, piercing, powerful light. It has no color. It's just raw, powerful. 
And then there's this black or dark light, sometimes has um, purple or magenta in it. And this light is so loving and so comfortable and cozy and, and, and safe. There's just something wonderful about the black or the dark light. And then the bright light. Some people say that a near-death experience is a white light experience. No, it's a bright light experience. Sometimes it's white, sometimes it's silver, sometimes it's gold, sometimes it's black, sometimes it's dark. Um, but that bright light, that's the light that talks to you, and you can talk to it, and, and there's something about this light that knows all about you. You can't lie. This light knows everything. And the little kids say, well, that bright light, that's father light. That darker black light, that's mother light. And that raw piercing light, that's God's light. And the mother light and the father light, they come from God's light. That's a child's. That's a child's description of the lights. Drawn to and highly proficient in math, science, and history, 93%. With adults afterward, most of those become healers. A lot of them become healers, teachers, ministers, psychics, or mediums. Um, with children, it's a little different. Yeah, you'll get some that become healers and, and psychics, but most of them go into science. Most of them go into math and history. In the back of the book, or um, toward the back of the book, is, is, a, um, is a chapter on historical cases. You're going to be amazed at how many, how many, um, Of the people that we admire so much had near-death exper experiences that were scientists. We've got Albert Einstein. We've got Mozart. We've got Abraham Lincoln. Um, a lot of scientists. Well, we've got our... <laughs> we've got Walter Russell, who was much of a scientist as he was an artist. But note, the younger the child, the greater the jump. The younger the child, the greater the jump in intelligence. Here we get, here we get the really serious part, loss of bonding with parents, 90%. 90%. That doesn't mean that they don't love their parents. It just means that they're still bonded to the other side, and that's where their love is. That's where their real sense of belonging is. It's on the other side, not this side. Difficult family situations, well, you can imagine, 62%. Return empathic, 84%, so that's most of them. Highly intelligent, 75%, that's most of them. Vivid dreams, that's most of them, 70%. Problem sleeping, though, 67%. Aware of the future, 61%. You're, you're going to love this. These kids, um, when they're old enough to date, a lot of them won't go out on dates. And they'll say, well, I know what's going to, I know what's going to happen. So why bother? <laughs> so they don't go. Aware of the future, 61%. That's, you know, they know what's coming. They may not know all of it, but they'll know some of it. Strong spiritual guidance knowing, 76%. Very successful career. Um, a number of them became millionaires. 74%. Remember that it's going to be a little tricky pretty soon. In the lower part of the page. First study tends towards suicide ideation, 21%. Second study, 74%.
The after effects increase with time. They do not decrease. Suicide ideation. Very successful career, 74%. Suicide ideation, 74%. So remember that as we go along. I have a whole chapter on it in the book, PTSD versus NDEs. After effects of near-death states for the very young can seem similar to a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. 34% were positive about their NDE, but 61% were negative. The reason for this? Many experiencers felt growing up and finding their place in life was just too difficult. Remember, most of the younger, youngest experiencers have no before, no way to compare anything. Many are still bonded to the other side. Let's stop here for just a minute. This kind of powerful experience is happening when the basic flooring is being laid in the brain for the digestive system, the nervous system, skin sensitivity, mind use. When that basic flooring is being laid, these kids are being flipped to a very different way of thinking and feeling and acting. It confuses them and it confuses their parents. I'm, I'm going to state that again. Near-death experiences that happen during the early years occur at a time when the basic flooring or patterning is being laid in the brain. Early formation of the temporal lobes, the nervous and digestive system, are also occurring. This flips the child into a different learning mode outside regular development, one based more on conceptual reasoning styles. Keep in mind that to a child, suicide's no big deal. They're seldom aware that any such action is going to hurt anybody. To them, being in light with loving people occurred when they weren't breathing. Now that they're breathing again, that beautiful world and the loving people are gone. For a child, it's like, aha, aha. The way to get back there then is to stop my breathing. And that's exactly what many of them try to do not aware at all that this might be negative or bad or mm, a horrible thing to do. For them, it's logical. That longing never quits even when highly successful and excited about life. I had an 86-year-old woman still wanting to go back to the other side. She never, that longing never quit. 82 years. Summary. I propose the following. These are proposals of mine. That there could have been challenges with Russell's birth or health issues in childhood that were intense enough to change his thinking and response patterns. Becoming a musician during infancy is an example of this. That's, that's sort of a twang in my brain in here. What he did with music when he's just an infant. Wow. I'll bet something happened with mama's pregnancy or his birth. That his near-death experience at age seven gave him the knowledge and strength he needed to leave home and school and seek employment not only to help his family, but to enable him at age 10 to become self-supporting and self-knowing. How many 10-year-olds do you know who are self-supporting and self-knowing? 
that his near-death experience at age 14 not only gave him the secrets of healing, as he claimed, but enabled him to move into at one moment with God. That each of the life-changing events that occurred every seven years, get that, every seven years, until he was 49, enabled him to use what he learned from each jump in consciousness, each download building on the previous, helping him to bring in more information and more knowing that the unusual pattern of near-death experiences, NDEs, and spiritually transforming events in the research world now, we call those STEs, beginning in infancy, were all in preparation for his experience in light at age 49. That it is no accident or fluke of events that enabled him to enter cosmic consciousness near the, near the age and during early summer as per Dr. Buck's predictions. Nor is it any accident that because of this transformation, get this, he was thought insane and rejected by his first wife and family. And they still today consider him insane. That NDEs and cosmic illuminations are actually part of tribal societies as well. Because in native societies, not only is the oral histories extensive and detailed, but many such movements in cosmic consciousness can still be found today in story form, music, and art. They kept their records in story form, music, and art. It was more of a right brain societies rather than left brain. But that, that information is still there, and you have these incredible, incredible cosmic consciousness illuminations in all races, all across this globe. That the way to cosmic consciousness is not magic. There is always a preparatory pattern beginning in early childhood that physically alters the brain and nervous system, enabling conceptual abstract development before foundational learning. Most Catholic saints had an NDE as a very small child, either before or shortly after starting school, to set the stage for what came next. I want to emphasize this last paragraph. Sudden illuminations always have a preparatory beginning state to protect the brain, to protect the nervous system, to protect the digestive system and skin sensitivity. Without this, insanity can occur. You don't, you don't just have these incredible illuminations, although you think you do. Look back. Look back at your childhood. If, you, if your mother's still around, check with her about her pregnancy and your birth. There is preparatory actions and stages setting up and beginning even then. Without that, insanity occurs or can occur. Walter Russell, the man who tapped the secrets of the universe, recorded his experience in the Divine Iliad. I love both of these books. I'm sure you do too. The man who tapped the secrets of the universe, the Divine Iliad. He spent six years penning the Universal One. That's my, very f that's my very favorite book of his. A text containing the drawings and revelations given to him 
of the universe and how it worked, covering such subjects as chemistry, physics, electromagnetics. Really, it took six years to do that. In fact, I'm amazed he did it even that fast. You know, it takes time to figure out. I mean, you know it, you see it. There it is. How are you going to put it in words that anybody else can understand it? He corresponded with Albert Einstein about his own theory that this is a thought wave universe created for the transmission of thought. Nikola Tesla, a Serbian American inventor, electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, physicist, and futurist, best known for his contributions to the design of modern alternating current AC electrical supply systems, was quite close to Walter Russell. He told Walter Russell he wanted him to lock up his information specifically in the Universal One for a thousand years. Can you imagine? He wanted him to lock it up for a thousand, a thousand years in the Smithsonian until the world's population was ready for it. <laughs> I love it. His second and lasting marriage was to English-born Leo Russell, herself a visionary since childhood. She had an NDE at age five, who grew up knowing that she was here to change the thinking of the world. Well, she sure did it. The universal law, natural science, living history, together they established the University of Science and Philosophy. Published many books. Yeah, you know, they're all over everywhere. Just an example of some of the things all charts and information revealed in the Universal One came from Russell's illumination into the light of cosmic consciousness when he was 49. Here's just some more samples. Russell's science is currently being reevaluated. Finally! Yes! We're bringing him back with exciting results. He was further ahead than anybody ever thought. Another example. And finally, where we are today at the museum. Yes, we're bringing it back. Thank you. <laughs>